is when i reflected on it a lot is coming from fear maybe if i pass a certain age then maybe i won't get a good partner Ugh, you know this so, is such bullshit i'm at yeah. stop <laughs> the idea that at a certain age you become unlovable is fucking insane and untrue welcome to your new episode of wish i knew that before i'm your host amit pandey and here we bring on guests from different walks of life to discuss ideas answer questions that can directly help a young adult navigate the journey of life a bit better our guest for today's show is an award winning writer speaker brand advisor her ted talk stop searching for your passion has garnered more than 7 million views and she says this is simply because so many people across the globe were feeling the pressure of finding their passion and her talk relieved them her book title unfollow your passion how to create a life that matters to you and there is an underline on the words to you because the book is not just about unfollowing your passion throughout the book she challenges so many painfully swallowed conventional ideas like seeking discomfort is good for you we should keep looking for our passion there is going to be happy ever after she challenges these ideas not just for the sake of challenging them instead She invites us to look at it with a fresh perspective through quality questions where while reading with an open mind you would stop laugh think and wonder wow that's so true imagine her as your friend who's an independent thinker when you're going to her with your problem she will sit beside you comfort you listen to you give you that warm cacao to drink and then call you on your bullshit she doesn't sit on a high ground and preach even though her work has been featured in Business Insider, Forbes, Inc and many more, even though she has backed number 2 spots, 6 spots over Oprah in Hub Spots, top 18 female speakers who are killing it list. So please join me in welcoming the author that truly wants you to think for yourself, build a life that matters to you while having fun. Part Buddha, part fun, total badass, Terry Trespicio. There you are. Yay! That was so beautiful. What a gorgeous introduction. I'm very honored by that. Thank you. Do you want to go and talk a lot about um there's so many topics like when I was researching you and reading your book I'm like <sighs> You know what? I should probably just create one season of Wish I Knew That Before with Terry and <laughs> there are there are topics <laughs> and I think people will still enjoy it because there is so much ground that you cover in your book um and as I mentioned it's not just about unfolding your passion at the core of it um this book and what you talk about is a lot about thinking for your own self becoming an independent thinker so let's actually start over there what does being an independent thinker means to you today yes what does it mean to be an independent thinker it means that you take in lots of information and perspectives and insights and opinions but you don't rely on any one of them it doesn't mean you don't listen to anyone because that's just called ignorant not independent but realize i was raised as a yeah, everyone's raised in a very specific situation but i was raised a catholic girl in a suburb of a suburb of new york city but in new jersey i had incredible privilege to have access to excellent education and i got not only wonderful you know i got to learn a lot of things that way but i also was told there was a way to be And I went to very progressive education and still there's still an undercurrent of what's expected of you as a woman as a catholic as anything right so you were raised a different way and everyone has their own set now I took a lot of those learnings to heart and later let a lot of them go but I think as you grow older every year because we're not growing younger you decide which ones you're going to keep and which you're going to let go of and that that's a decision right you know i really don't identify with religion at all i don't do things because the church tells me to like that i i'm far beyond that for a long time i did yeah, yeah. you know and we'll get into that it's personal mainly yeah. personal and professional but 
you know, it's hard for us to say like, well, to be an independent thinker, be like me, because then you're yeah. not being an independent thinker. You're yeah. trying to be like me. So yeah. I think in answer to your question, it is taking in the landscape of opinions and all the resources you have available to you and seeking good ones out mm. and still deciding which of those you will choose and why. And that's a decision in itself. Which yes. one do you choose and why? And you might change your mind too. Yeah. Yeah. I changed my mind. I'm very persuadable. I'll have one opinion <laughs> that another, except for some very core, except for some of our very core beliefs. But yeah. for a lot of it, I might go, well, oh, maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, but that process in itself, it's a very tough process, right? I, I mean, how do you? Because um, a lot has to be that you have to become aware that this is something that you know, because you pick and choose your battle, because that's what came to my mind as well. You won't question everything, you know, because sometimes that is just like reinventing the wheel and challenging everything because and, and that's what I said, you don't challenge ideas for the sake of just challenging everything. You pick and choose the ideas that you feel no, that's that's bullshit. So how can someone actually become aware on what ideas to challenge? And what ideas are like, it, it doesn't bother me right. that much. I can work with it. Yeah. Well, you check with your gut, right? Because uh, someone who challenges every idea and thinks that makes them smart really just makes them an asshole usually. <laughs> you don't want to go out to dinner with this person, right? Yeah. You don't want to be in a relation with this person because they're always fighting you. I don't fight to fight. That is a lot of energy. I reserve it for what matters. So how do we decide? Well, a good place to consider is where in your life at work or personally, you feel stuck. Now, I mostly hear this from women. Of course, I do a lot. I just kind of know more women than I do men. Um, but women in particular will tell me that they feel stuck. And I say, stuck sounds like there's no getting out of it. To me, what stuck means is suspended between two poles, two or more poles. One is what everyone thinks you should do, what society tells you you should do. But then there's what you want to do, but you're worried that if you do this, you'll disappoint them. And if you do what they want, you'll disappoint yourself. And so whenever I feel stuck about a thing, I go, okay, well, why do I feel that way? Like I immediately investigate. So if you're going to put that much attention on a thing, you do it because well, where does it matter to me? Where is my own indecision hmm. about thinking or doing or not? Where is my own indecision uh, making me feel hamstrung where I can't move forward? Hmm. Otherwise, you're just picking fights. You're like skeet shooting. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> just shooting at everything? You know, it's a waste of energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a fine balance, as you said, like disappointing yourself or disappointing your loved ones in society. And yeah. It's not zero sum, by the way. It doesn't yeah, mean it you is. have to choose one and then you're going to disappoint yeah, everyone. Yeah. But a lot of times we think other people care what we do more than they actually do. I have discovered as I've gotten older, and I am a bit older than you, uh, that, oh my gosh, the things that I thought people cared about when I was in my 20s, like no one cares. They're all just kind of <laughs> trying to take care of their own stuff. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And um I think uh, there's this beautiful quote that I keep coming back to. Uh, it is, um, I think, by author Cooley that I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what you think I think I am. So if you want, I can Whoa, repeat. I need a minute with that. I, 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 let, that I, I, I always give a minute for people to think about that because the quote is, I am not what I think I am. I am not what you think I am, because you could think completely different about me. I am what you think I think I am. So whatever I think you are thinking about me, that's what's that is what governing me a lot. Oh, I see. My I actions. See. Yeah. That's really tricky. And it's hard. It and is I think tricky. especially since you're a, you're a man in your twenties. Yeah. And you're in the early stages of pretty much everything, right? Yeah, and yeah. so there's a desire and, and a young young people, right? There's a feeling that they must define who they are. Mm -hmm. Like I need to know and I need to be able to put it on a resume or put it on social or say it. I need to know it or else I can't move forward. This is the thing I would love to relieve every young person of and every middle-aged person and every old person. <laughs> Everyone, because 
I also thought I was supposed to know. And that's why this, I, this advice about following your passion didn't help because I didn't know what I wanted yet because I hadn't done anything in my twenties yet. It was very new. Everything was new. So if I, you know, if I had one piece of insight that is helpful to me, that might be helpful to you or listeners is that this idea that you should define it. I, I used to do that. I, I was exactly 27. Actually, I remember uh. I was dating someone who had a specific taste in music. And I was like, do I like that music? What music do I like? Do, do I, if I like this music, I think I'm cooler. If I like this music, can I learn to like this music? Like I was forever trying to codify my personality. And the fun of it is realizing that it changes and changes over and over again. So when people who are older than you say, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. We mean that yeah. because you're never done. You're not like, that's who I am. That's set. That is what they call fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Yeah. And I'm sure you've, you've heard about yeah, this. Carol yeah. Dweck yeah, is Carol known Dweck's for work. doing this yeah. work, right? Yeah. And it's pretty central to how I look at everything. Because if we really think that we're set, that I'm born to be a doctor or I'm born to be the mother of five kids or someone's wife, if I believe I'm those things and I can't be the things I might dream of being, oh, I could never be a writer or I could never do public speaking, then you have opted out before you even know where the growth mindset says, I can evolve, I can learn, I can take what I know and add to it and expand and become even better than I imagine. It doesn't mean we all have endless and infinite potential. I'm never going to be a star basketball player. Yeah. You're never going to be what? Like imagine. Yeah, but even that, a basketball player, I'm very short. Like I'm five, you're, five, you're four. Not be Neither <laughs> of us are going to be doing that. But this idea, right, that we still can grow an incredible amount is what's exciting. So I would say don't try to define too early. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't try to define. I think you wrote um wrote in your book somewhere that, that came up for me, I think, is um, allow the life to unfold. Allow the life to unfold. Um, and that's where you'll find some freedom. Yeah. Oh, it's the only place. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where I think you'll find some freedom because a lot of times, <laughs> and it's quite counterintuitive, which came up for me, is... Uh, in the self-help space, a lot of motivational um, speakers or gurus, they talk a lot about, oh, like, um, you can do whatever you want to do, but then go and define yourself. Like, oh follow. My God. And... <laughs> you can't do whatever you want to do. There's not like an endless limitation. That isn't fair. Yeah. Because if I said, go write a book, write about whatever you want, go write it now, yeah. you would be frozen. You'd yeah. be like, well, yeah. what do I do? That endless option thing is not exactly motivating. Yeah. yeah. And nor, do, nor do we have to consider every option, but we must give ourselves <laughs> some options. Yeah. Yeah. We have to give ourselves some options in things that we want to grow in and things that we want to um, work on. One of the things that um, what what you wrote is... is um, Covering dif different aspects, you know, like in our lives, as, as we touched upon, there are different aspects that we swallow. One of the things cover, coming up from India is that uh, there are th there's, there's my pet peeve. Uh, and that ha it has grown on me that respect your elders, you know, don't talk back. Uh, don't ask them many questions and that's the Indian culture like that's and, a rule you can't talk to uh, elders and uh, learn from them no no like don't talk back to them if they're oh, okay. saying something just just do it uh, I mean in a lot of places and that's where my tussle also like because I'm 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 like I'm not talking back. I'm trying to uncover what the rational behind what you're trying to explain. And they they cannot explain. They they are like, no, this is how it is. This is how it has been. Just okay. follow it, you know. Um, That's an interesting cultural conflict there it, because you want to understand. Yeah. And, and yet you're discouraged maybe. Yeah, from yeah. Asking. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. And um, that's how I, I, I don't blame a lot of um, the 
my parents and all of those people about it because i mean it's it's like they have grown into a different culture my baseline is very different right now uh, i'm at a very privileged place where i have food to eat i have never been homeless and things so now i am questioning a lot of things in my life you know now my baseline like the maslow's hierarchy yes. there is like it is taken care of so now i'm questioning what is life <laughs> for my mom and dad what do you it's want good. why do you want to question all of those things right and one of the tussle that i get into a lot uh, with my mom and dad and it it is about getting married so i'll i'll give you some context where i am at right now um, i'm 27 and uh, i have been single for almost now four or five years and i was happily single you know i was happily single there were so many things that i discovered in my after my breakup you know like it happens i don't know with girls but at least with guys i have noticed that after your breakup you sort of get into this phase of i'm going to be a good person i'm going to figure out myself and you go on this self help journey and sort of and i and i discovered so many things that i can do in this life um things that excite me i got into toastmasters did a lot of public speaking that's exciting uh, it is it is fun and um to me so a lot of personal development happen on that side and it was exciting now around this age of 26 27 i was getting into this phase and maybe you can say it's like maybe it's the age or the people around you um that sort you sort of put you in that space where you see where you uh, one fine one fine night i find myself watching a romantic uh, movie and i'm like i wish i have a partner and i was getting into that phase and also at the same time my mom and dad were also questioning that hey you're turning 27 um and um, soon you should get married and it, i'm having very hard time explaining it to them because also i am also not very clear um about whether i should get married or not but Wait, one are thing are you in a relationship right now no i am not so then why you don't have a choice about getting married you're not in a yeah. relationship right, why do you have to right. make a decision about marriage that's like just yeah. that's like deciding if i should swim in the ocean when i'm in the middle of the desert hmm. Wait, why why are you making a decision about something that's not an option now if you were in a relationship for yeah. the past 6 years yeah. and she wanted to get married and you're not sure that's the time to discuss yeah. whether marriage is for you now yeah. Yeah. But you there's no point this is an example of picking fights that don't matter right now. Because what are you arguing over? You're not in a relationship right now, Amit. Yeah. There's no yeah, question yeah, of yeah. should yeah. I get married to whom? <laughs> to uh, to your computer, to a house plan? Whether marriage is for you is not for you to know right now because it's not an option. Yeah. No, so I, 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 I think Why you're... have the philosophical discussion? I don't know like it's exhausting and it will drive yeah. a wedge. Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because previously, what was happening for me in 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 like in my mind, I was like, okay, so there is so there's there are two concepts. There's one like love marriage in India, and they call it arranged marriage, where your parents or like in your community or people like that, yeah. they sort of like you know arrange things and find girl. And in India, it's like oh, arranged marriage. It's like you date it's probably a thing. yeah, it's a thing. It's you date probably for six months and then. So as I was getting so I. so why i was thinking about this about the marriage point i think because when i reflected on it a lot is coming from fear in terms of where i have maybe accepted it somewhere that maybe if i pass a certain age then maybe i won't get a good partner Ugh. you know this so, is such bullshit i'm at yeah. stop yeah stop, yeah yeah i mean like stop the madness <laughs> First of all, you yeah. can get married any damn time you want. My aunt Helen got married to her boyfriend of 40 years when they were in their 70s. Yeah. And the only reason they got married, they were happily together monogamously for decades. The yeah. only reason they got married is because they were living in an elder community in Florida and their neighbors thought they were living in sin. So they got married out of pressure at 76. Now yeah. they really didn't want to date around they were both dead within a few years anyway hmm. so yeah they finally got married but they did their own thing for as long as they wanted i wanted to spell this right now because you brought hmm. it up yeah, this yeah. idea are we dropping f bombs on here or are we not oh we let's do it let's do it <laughs> the idea that at a certain age you become unlovable is fucking insane yeah. and untrue yeah you yeah. don't even have eggs 
and you're worried yeah. about being yeah. too old. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, the odds are in your favor. That fact is that men can date at any, at any age and find partners, whatever, and women will tell themselves they can't. Women will say, well, I can't. Well, after a certain age, women cannot have kids. That's true. So women have decisions to make about that. And through the wonders of modern science, women can have their eggs frozen. If they have the resources, they can delay. I have a friend who used a donor egg and a donor sperm and finally had the baby she always wanted at 50. So don't tell me that there's, and she's not in a relationship, yeah. but she wanted that baby. Those are two different things. Yeah. So yeah. if you think, let me tell you the fastest way to misery, to fucking misery, you go hurry up and find a girlfriend yeah. and marry them because you're afraid of being too old. Then you will be in the longest slog of your fucking life wondering why you did a thing because you thought you should. The world is riddled as we speak with miserable couples who did it because they thought they should and they should grab someone now before they were undesirable. I am 48 years old. I tend to date men younger than me. I tend to have my friends who are younger than me. Yeah. I have never had a problem finding someone to date if I felt like it. And it's not because I'm a certain age or a certain weight or any of those things. The world is crawling with men and it's crawling with women. Yeah. And many of them <laughs> are bright and warm and lovable. And when they find you, whatever year that is, they will be so grateful that, and you will be so grateful that you'll decide to spend time together. I will also add I am a woman who loves to be in partnership with people, but who has gone many years not in a relationship. And those years were no unhappier than years I was with someone. Mm. Partner will not make you happy. Yeah. Marriage will not make you happy, but it can make you miserable. You better be damn sure when you <laughs> sign up for that, that you know that is why you're doing that. And the word of warning, I cannot ring it loudly enough, is that you do not make major law abiding, like legally binding rather choices to share things with people because you think you should. Have I warned you enough, Amit? Because you, 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 you will have fuck your life up <laughs> and you will fuck someone else's life up if you get into a thing. You dis this is where you don't dis disrespect yeah. your elders, but yeah. you quietly ignore them. Yeah. Because if you want to participate in the arranged marriage tradition, and hmm. many millions of people have and have come to love their partners and have had successful bonds and wonderful lives, hmm. they may have had a choice in the matter. They may not. Yeah. You and I have the liberty of getting to choose who we're with. And we do and don't have to. Like, we don't have to do the things we don't want to do. Yeah. yeah. But you better know <laughs> that when you choose that, and you could be 35, you could be 45 and meet a woman that you fall in head over heels in love with. Do you think she's going to go, oh, well, I would have liked you 35? No, she might have just divorced a real jerk and cannot believe her luck in meeting you. Yeah. You cannot define, you cannot predict, but you can make commitments before you're ready and you will yeah. live to regret it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> I think, I think, oh. Uh... It it happens, right? Like, I have that inner instinct sometimes, which is like, that's why I related a lot with your writing and the way you present things, um, is that I always have this curiosity. I'm a very curious guy. So I always have this curiosity. What if we experiment? You know, what if we experiment that I don't get married? Because right now, there are so many other things that are much more exciting to me. Um, Again. That I, you can yeah. experiment. Yeah. Your life is an experiment. E exactly. Like, like, and I'll remind you, yeah. there's no one for you to marry right now. Yeah, there is no one, at least in, not in my... Not, uh, in, not my... today. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think that's a great question that you brought up. Like, why am I fretting over it even when I am not even in a relationship? This is a waste of time. Next. It's yeah. a waste of your time. It is a like, waste of time. Everyone can say like, oh, I don't think I'd want to be married. And then they fall in love and they do get married. Yeah. Or they say, I want to be married. And they never marry. And yeah. they're just as happy. Yeah. I am. I don't have. Uh, I am in a relationship right now. Yeah. But I do not have children. I never yeah. wanted to have children. It just wasn't in my plan. Yeah. And I am very happy with that decision. Yeah. So this idea that there's a scripted way. 
just mm. isn't true. But I think that you just stay open to love. I mean, anyone can watch a rom-com, by the way, and decide yeah. they want a partner, but that's not <laughs> what life is, you know? So I think it's like, true. the important thing is to be open to love in all its forms. Yeah. But even if you met someone today, <laughs> after we have this interview, you go to a coffee shop and you fall in love with someone, yeah. you're going to have to date her for a few years. And then maybe you'll live together. And then maybe you'll consider marriage. And then maybe you'll consider kids. Yeah. This shit takes time. You're on no one's schedule. Your life is an experiment. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I view it. But 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 that's the thing, right, Terry? Like, it's, as, as you said, like, Terry, I'm 27. You're at my place. And, and it's it's scary. It's scary. Terry, you, you... To what? To not be married? That's no, not scary. You're not no, married now. Not just, yeah, not just, not just being married or so, but, like, looking at life in terms of experimentation and going against, like, swimming against the current... How how did you actually because today when I when I listen to you and and not just today I think when I was reading your um, articles from from back in 2014 or so you had oh such uh, like yeah I, I went went far back you really did a deep dive <laughs> uh, so um, I I I read that interview with you wrote like get rejected more you're not doing it enough like lessons for girls to actually go out there like a lot of times the guys are given the uh, idea that oh go out there and actually talk to girls and this and that and here yeah, you are what do you have to lose yeah yeah and and here you are giving that advice to girls like no like guys would get girls but like what if you are just sitting there waiting for those shoes to just click and then find your partner so. I think you have developed it over these years and I would love to deep dive on that side. Like one is like you, you said that it is it is a gut check that happens. Like you ask yourself that is it serving me? Is it not serving me? Is there anything else that you discovered in this process? And did you always like when kept going ahead with those ideas where it's like, okay, this doesn't serve me. I won't do it. Or was that was there points where you actually went back? And then went forward and then went back. How, how, how did no, you No, I don't know. I mean, it just, it wasn't like I, again, like, and then people, even in the writing of this book, people are like, oh, you yeah. had the plan and then you wrote to us. I was yeah. like, no, not at all. Yeah. You live your way into it. I yeah. just really, in my mind was like, I have, like, I was in a lot of friends' weddings around 27 is what mm. happens. And by the way, don't, it's not just the elders. Don't underestimate the pressure of friends. Oh. <laughs> friends who have been married, you go to the weddings. Oh, what are you next? That is why a lot of people decide to get engaged because, well, everyone else yeah. is. It's not peer pressure and it's not stupid. This is how groups function. But I found myself, and I don't think I'm all that different, but I would be in my friend's weddings. I was in a lot of my friend's weddings. Yeah. And I would be walking down the aisle behind her and I was like, gut check. Do I wish this were me? And mm. I was like, nope. Not one bit. And I was like, oh God, this feels so final. And it feels so like, how do they know? Even then I said, we're so young. Why would you sign up for life? This or why? What, what is what is this pressure? So I, it's not that I didn't feel pressure, but no one was personally pressuring me. Um, the relationships I was in, I was like, do I really want to commit to this person for the long haul? No. Do I love them? Yes. But is it over? Yes. And I said to my family, I said to my family one day when I was probably a little older than you. Yeah. I was with my whole family. And I said, listen, because I have two younger sisters who wanted to be married and had kids, have kids. They wanted that life. They knew they wanted it. Yeah. One of them had little kids already. And I said, listen, I feel like I have to say this to you since you're my family, my parents and my two sisters. I said, but I think that I'm not going to do this. I think I'm not going to be doing this conventional life. I don't believe I'm going to be married at all or anytime soon. And I don't believe I don't. I don't believe I want kids. And I just want to check in to make sure everyone's cool with that. Not that I would have changed my opinion, but I just want to check in. And my sisters both said, this is probably not for you. You're right. And I think it's really smart to do what's right for you. They didn't give me one bit of pressure. My dad fell asleep in the conversation. He was napping. We're like, dad, uh, do you care that Terry doesn't have kids? He goes, no, do whatever you want. And then, and then my mother, I said, do you feel any bit of disappointment in me if I don't do what you did? Yeah. And she said, no, do not, she said, get married for me and do not have kids for me. Yeah. That is something only you decide. 
Now I was very lucky to have a mother who saw that way. I could have easily had a mother who said you should, or I've, I've talked to women whose mother yeah, said, yeah. I disown you if you don't get married yeah, and have kids. Yeah. It is incredibly selfish is incredibly uh, limited. And you know, my mother knew, in fact, my mother has said to me many times, yours is the life I want next. Uh. <laughs> you did it right. Not that she regrets her life. She loves us. She loves our life. But I was very purposeful. And I said, I really, what I pictured, when you picture yourself in the future and you go, where am I going to be? I was living in Massachusetts at the time. I said, I just really want to be in New York City. Yeah. I would love to be in some kind of high rise apartment where I could look out and see all the windows and the lights. And I want to be, feel confident walking around the city. And I, I, maybe I could be a writer. I don't know. I don't know what that even looks like. <laughs> and where the fuck am I right now? I am in a high rise building in the middle of Manhattan. This is where I wanted Ooh. to be. I pay through the fucking nose to be here. But I made it happen because I wanted to do it. And I wasn't waiting for someone else to make it for me, to marry a lawyer or someone who could pay for it. I could have done that, I guess. But I also said, why can't I do it myself? Yeah. And you can. But that was my vision. If your vision, Amit, is to be partnered, and I would bet money that at some point you will fall in love with someone and be with someone, and that will be wonderful. Yeah. I have a hard time believing a yeah. sweetheart, a smart, yeah. kind sweetheart <laughs> like you is going to roam around unclaimed. But I will say I'm being a little bit maybe sexist or something, because when people say to me, like when I first started dating the man that I'm with now, uh -huh. he said, I, it's hard for me to believe why you're single. And I said, mm. I know you mean that as a compliment, but it's really insulting. <laughs> it is so insulting. when women when women are told, like, why are you single? Yeah, yeah. It's insulting. Because what yeah. you're saying is, you're single. You must have been claimed by a man by now. How are you out running around? There must be something wrong, wrong with, with you. you. And that is fucked in the worst possible way. Mm. I said, do you think I'm a catch? And he said, yes. That's why I have a hard time believing that you're mm -hmm. single. I said, if I'm this much of a catch, why in hell would I settle? Mm. Aren't you a little surprised? Why am I settling for you? I don't know. I'm going to find out. But like the women who go around and aren't with someone and go, oh my God, what's wrong with me? You're selective. You have high standards. I'm not letting those bend. So that what? I have someone else's laundry to do? No, thank you. I will do his, <laughs> I will do his laundry if he asks. Yeah. But be on my terms. Yeah, yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. I mean, on on your terms in deciding, I think what what what's coming up for me is you know like I think somewhere deep in my heart, um, I totally vibe with what you're saying because that's where I'm at as well. I'm ready to experiment. Uh, my mom and dad says, oh, like, they, they give me that the egg reason that you said. So they don't tell me that, oh, you you have to have, like, they, they're like, oh, but the girl that you married, she also needs to have a kid. And But I'm like, but what, what if I can just adopt someone, you know? Like, I can adopt a child if I want to. I don't really need to have. So I have been questioning a lot about it that, what if, what if, what if, you know? So I think, but but what happens is sometimes you want other people to actually say that to you. Not a lot of my friends because they are also no living in will. that, they, they are living in that fear of, uh, right. no, maybe you are right, Amit, maybe. Also, I mean, Amit, yeah. your friends who get married, yeah, they don't want to be the only ones. Ah. They would like, <laughs> marriage is the thing where they're like, you should do it, I did it. Like they want the affirmation and then they're all in it together. Yeah, yeah. You know, most of my friends are single. I have lots of close friends who are married too. Yeah. But there's a lot of, and the fact is, if all of your friends are married and they're all off doing couple things and you're like, but I'm not part of the group anymore. The fact is, this is where the evolving matters. Yeah. If you don't want to do that and they want and are always trying to introduce you to someone's sister-in-law, yeah. if you like that, great. Yeah. But sometimes you have to find new friends. Oh, yeah. Because Finally. if your friends are, all, if you know, it's not that you can't be friends with them, but your life can't revolve around the married couples yeah. if they're doing things that married yeah. people do. Yeah. So I, at 36, moved to New York City. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is how I got here. I didn't come as a young <laughs> thing. I was already, you know, well into my career when yeah. I moved here. And I met 
all new friends because I moved to a new city and I I took an improv acting class for yeah. fun. Yeah. And I met my new friends. These are a lot of my closest friends. Yeah. And they were a completely different group and they were younger and they were single. And I've enjoyed many years of hanging out and doing fun things with them. Yeah. So it's not because you're this age, you have to hang out with this age person. Yeah. If you want your life to have a full spectrum, oh, spend yeah. time with people of different ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And different I, lifestyles too. Hundred percent. I think. I think. Um, I'm actually living a very cool life, at least according to me. <laughs> it sounds like it's going well. Isn't that all that matters? It, it matters to what you. Man, what do we that, say? To exactly. You. To to you. And I think that's why this podcast got me so excited because. Um, there's this guy named Jesse Itzler. He talks about building your life resume. He's like, people always talk about Oh my God, that work. sounds like hell. What does that mean? I don't no, want to write I, another resume. No, 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 like life resume, which is like, you do cool stuff. We always talk about work resume. And here you are doing things that matter to you. You like I love scuba diving. I found scuba diving very meditative. I go out on scuba dive. Uh, I constantly show up in my Toastmasters meeting. A lot of my friends are like, but you are a fine speaker. Why do you just keep going? I'm like, I just love it. I love you to, love to doing go. it. I love doing it. Uh, people, people are like, oh, you're an engineer. Why are you doing podcasts? And I'm like, I just love it. Who's saying these things? This I mean, is the best are... part. This is what makes you so interesting, right? What yeah. are you supposed to do? Sit there and be an engineer 24-7? Exactly. And but this like, is this is the thinking. This is the yeah. industrial age hangover thinking that Seth Godin talks a lot about. Yeah, yeah. Where we assume like you're supposed to be this one thing. And the way I say it is that no one is a standard poodle except a standard poodle. Like <laughs> that's what they are. That's who they are. But you're not. We're all hybrids. And the most interesting people I've met do yeah. lots of things. They okay. they might be a lawyer, they might be a copywriter, or they might be a scuba diving instructor, but maybe yeah. they also sketch, or they're yeah. also speakers or singers. Yeah. Like, who said that you had to be just the one thing? Yeah. I think it's really wonderful. This podcast gives to you and your fans yeah. something that engineering wouldn't, it can't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Like, and, and, and I'm so glad that you also worked for a nine to five job and today you are working i wouldn't say for your i work own... every day all yeah, the time now, now you're working. <laughs> so you know that you so and you provide so nuanced perspective like a lot of my friends they are like oh you you must hate engineering i'm like no why would they say that do you I hate it? no i love engineering i i am in my zone when i'm writing codes and doing stuff but in these three years i realized that that's not a lifetime thing for me. I love it. And I see myself doing it for a few more years. But in my lifetime ahead, I have other more projects that excite me rather than just sitting behind a, a computer and just coding stuff. I, I, I'll i do it for... for you for, are a full-time employee. Somewhere. I am a full-time employee. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. love that you love it. Who, this is so bad that we assume that full-time jobs are terrible. They're exactly. not. They're not. It feeds you, right? Doesn't it It scratch an itch in your brain that you really love? Yeah, yeah. And then you'll do it for a bit. Exactly. And your friends are saying you must hate it. These friends, I, I'm really having a problem with these friends of yours. They're, yeah, they're putting I, bad I, I, ideas in <laughs> No, I mean, I, mean I, I see where they are also coming from because it's, it's, it's like that, right? Like, I think a lot of times we judge people not to judge them, but also to make sense of how to behave with them. You know, like we judge mm -hmm. people to also understand how should we, like this person seems friendly, this person seems reserved. So I want to know, I want to be certain how should I behave with them. So they are also trying to understand okay maybe this is not the conventional norm not a lot of people who are they they also want to make sense of what people are doing where they should be and their own perspective so i see that and I, i'm like yeah but that's your perspective i see life very differently and i think it's a, it's a perfect segue to one of the things that you brought about is that you can keep doing things and they would come an end and you just leave it you know, yes. you, you <laughs> end right. it. And uh, as this beautiful, uh, <laughs> uh, this um, songwriter, singer, I think Adam Levine, he he said, if happy ever after did exist, <laughs> I would still be holding you like this. So happy ever after in a lot of places doesn't exist. And making peace with that is tough. Yes. How, like, let's let's talk about that. What are your thoughts on it? 
Well, I mean, I never believed there was a happily ever after. I like the idea of happily now and what's next, you know, like (laughs) I don't like to say goodbye to people and I don't like, I get sad. I mean, when I was graduating high school and I I went to a very small, all girls Catholic high school, Mm -hmm. wore uniforms, there was only 54 graduating seniors, like tiny. I was so distraught at the thought of leaving and moving away from home. I was very homebound, very close to my family. The idea of going away to Boston College, which is where I decided to go. Oh my God, I I stopped speaking to my family months before. I just shut down because I was absolutely terrified and couldn't believe this was ending. Mm -hmm. And then, then I went away to school and I was homesick and I was a mess for a few months. But then what happens? You gain new muscles in new places and and you're able to see who you are in other settings. And then when college ended, I shut down again and I had like, (laughs) I don't know what to do. That's normal. That's called transition. But the people who have the hardest time with life are those who cannot acknowledge that things have a beginning, a middle and an end. Most relationships most jobs, most uh, careers, most leases, mortgages, like everything we do, <laughs> friendships. I've had friendships end and it's painful, but it ends. This idea that things are supposed to last forever, even friendships, is not true. And yet it's hard, but we learn a lot from the endings, don't we? We really do. But if we're not able to let go of certain things, then we cannot move on. To what's next and this is coming from someone who gets real homesick and gets cries through every transition it's not like it's easy for me but i know that there's something on the other side and the thing about relationships let me say this because some people do fall in love love being married something happens it grew they grow apart whatever happens happens and this idea that there's no next that there's nothing after that is incredibly you know, I mean, I, look, I haven't been through something like that. I have a sister who's divorced. It's a nightmare, right? It is. But this idea that a relationship shouldn't end, what's our definition of, of a good relationship? Yeah. That you die <laughs> while that you die while you're in it. That you die in it. The old, if you survive a relationship, technically the relationship failed. I'd rather that. I'd rather survive my relationships than drop dead. Yeah. So yeah. I think we have to shift our perspective of that, that things can be good. I had a second TED talk that not mm. nearly as many people saw mm. about mm. relationships. And it's called, um, we need to rethink happily ever Happy after. Ever after yes. Yeah. And the idea is that you can have a wonderful relationship and have it fulfill its role in your life and it's over. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, I think, I think a lot of, um, I think at, at, at the core of it, it's like the things that we have. Like when I was growing up, I saw a lot of Bollywood rom-com movies. And that oh. was my definition of love and the way I should behave, um, the way uh, life is. And oh, by think, a screenwriter? You let a screenwriter tell you what life's it, like? It, it, exactly. I did not have my own screenwriting going on at that <laughs> time. <laughs> I did not have... I, I I was just like living and not caring too much about like life and this and that. But when I actually started to question it at a certain age, because I feel a lot of our learning at an earlier age happens... For a, lot, for a lot of us, it happens unconsciously. We're still trying to make sense of this world and the things that, that are happening to us. But I think as we grow uh, older, we start to see things for what they are, not for what we want them to be. It's sort of clarity yes. comes in. Yes. And that clarity, I think it's important. It's important. It's our duty. Like maybe earlier learning happened for you, for a lot of us, and we didn't question a lot of things. But as you are growing up, and you're becoming sort of more intelligent on the sea, like experience and time teaches you a lot of things. It's mm-hmm. your duty. It's your duty to question the things that, you know, like the independent thinking, uh, things that are serving me, things that are not serving me and all of those things. Totally. One of one of the, um, I think, uh, things that you mentioned, and I'm glad that you sent me towards the uh, later part of your book, which is Uncle Bob's story, your sister's story and Bridget's story. Oh, and thank they, you. All Those three, stories mean a lot to me, yes. When I read them, I honestly, like, it just, and that's why I, I rewrote a part of your introduction where I said she's part Buddha, 
part fun, part badass, because you wrote something very beautiful, um, which I want to, which I want to uh, quote here that we are immortal souls animating a meat puppet for a short time. And it's very hard to reconcile that divide between part that will keep going and the part that will end. And I was like, whoa, (laughs) 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 hold on, let me take a moment to absorb it. And (laughs) that was, that was beautiful. It was beautifully, beautifully written. Um, And, and, through Uncle Bob's story, and if 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 you are fine talking about it, of course, going and and the lesson that you imparted around freedom. Let's actually talk about it. Yes, yeah. my Uncle Bob was a priest. He went into the priesthood. You want to talk about making an early decision that cuts <laughs> off all the other decisions? Um, he went into the priesthood, and he was a brilliant thinker and writer. And he was a professor at the University of Scranton for his like his whole life, mm. uh, and. He was the one I feel who saw me and knew me in ways that no one else did. He really understood me. And he is the one who took me around the world. Like he said, it's time for you to see the world. Like when I hit 24. And so he took me to Jerusalem and Italy. Like we went around the world because he would take study tours abroad. Mm -hmm. So he let me see the world, right. And, and really supported me. And he was the one who said to me when I was, you know, my when I was your age. And I said, well, everyone's getting married. And he said to me, and he was the only adult who ever said this. You, you know, you don't have to do that if you don't want. And I said, I don't. And he goes, no, you could teach if you want, because that was his go-to. He's a teacher. He's like, you could teach. You could take the summers off so you could write and travel. You can do whatever you want. And no one had ever said that. People had said to me, you could be whatever you want. You could do it. But people had said, but you'll probably do this. So you'll probably do that. But who knew? He knew. And so later, obviously, he died very young. He was in his 60s. Um, he had prostate cancer, which he had been fighting, and finally came back. And you just don't escape that. And I was in the room when he died. And that chapter was particularly difficult to write because it was about him and saying goodbye to him, which had to happen, right? But also around, you know, around the, the couple of years around that time, one of my best friends, uh, from college who I'd lived with after college, uh, was also racked with cancer at a very young age while she was pregnant with her second child and did not make it a couple months. They were able to deliver this baby at how many weeks? I mean, I had a couple weeks. I mean, this I baby 26 was 26 weeks or so, I think. So, so tiny. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. had to get that baby out because the house was on fire. Her body was just riddled. There was no fixing. There was no treating it. And so they took baby out. She never held that baby. There's a picture, one picture of her kind of tapping on the glass at that baby. And that baby is alive and well and a grown kid and running around with her dad and her sister. And it's astonishing to me that 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 happens, which, of course, anytime you hear of a dying mother, of course, it's going to every time we hear it, we're going to cry about it. But this was my person. Right. This was my friend. And so it was different for me. But it reminded me of the octopus, which is also in that chapter. I became obsessed with octopuses, which is the plural, by the way, (laughs) Uh, not octopi, uh, because I read a book about octopuses and I was fascinated with it, Um, The Soul of an Octopus, which is an excellent read. And when I learned about the octopus, and this is why this ties back to you and to everyone listening, not just to my friend Bridget, who I I miss very much, the octopus, the female octopus, doesn't give birth until the end of her life. At the end of her life, she lays these eggs. She, she, there's millions of, I forget how many, tons and tons of eggs. And her life is devoted to caring for them until they hatch. In fact, that mother will not leave those eggs. She might uh, starve to death, but she won't go hunt. She'll just sit there until the eggs, or if the eggs do hatch and she's alive, she's so worn out that she usually just wanders off and dies. I mean, it's a really dramatic horror opera of an ending, but those babies, she doesn't raise them and hold them and look at their potential. She raised, she gives them all the best opportunities she can. And then um, on around the same time, they all open up and all those teeny tiny microscopic octopuses go out into the water. She can't know whether those will succeed or they'll remember her or be like her. Probably not. Most of them get gobbled up. It's part of the eco landscape there. But some of them turn in to full grown 
octopuses. And they don't bear no memory of that mother, but they know what they must do too. And the point of this is that we must take man or woman, we must give all of our eggs the opportunity to hatch and grow. The work we do, the art we create, whatever it is we're up to. And you don't go, well, is this one better? Do I care more about this one? You give it your fucking all and you let it grow and you care for them. You don't starve to death and wander off and die <laughs> in a state of amnesia. Let's not do that. Yeah. But you give it everything you have because that's all you have. That is all the time you have. And you give it everything. And if some of it turns into something that matters to someone else, great. But we cannot agonize over this or that and worry a what if, da, 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 da. If you give everything you've got to the life you have, you will never be disappointed because you know you did what you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, true. <laughs> I was just like in the moment and that's why I was like, um, I didn't have anything to say because you just, and you have a knack this because when I was listening to so many of your talks as well, you have a knack for people. Like I found myself a lot of times just like listening to you, listening to you. <laughs> And just think nothing is going through my head. I'm just like in the moment and listening. And that's where you hit a note with those beautiful story about your Uncle Bob, Bridget and um, the octopus. And that's such a beautiful way to look at things, because I think at the underlying, um, uh, at the core uh, in your book as well, you see that don't agonize over that one thing, that one passion that... You think that today you will reach there, you will find it, and that's what the world wants you to believe, that everything will be sorted. No, no, there will still be another quest, there will still be another question, another challenge that would still be out there. So why don't we, in the moment, give our best to the things that we already have with us? Um, right. Give it, give, it our, give it our best, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before I ask my last question, um, Terry, where can people find you and connect with you? And there is, uh, yeah, like uh, there's so many things that I like. As I said, like in our in my introduction, that we can talk about passion. There's so many things that we didn't even touch upon, and maybe in the future we'll circle back on. Sure. Um, yeah, but like today, when you're here, where can people actually find you and the best way to connect with you that you want people to come and visit? It's hard not to find me because okay. I'm on a, basically every platform. But what's hard is when you're on all the platforms, it's easy for me to miss stuff. So if yeah. you want to be, let's start with the easiest, lowest common denominator. If you want, to, I send out regular emails. I'm always talking to my community. If you want to be part of that, you just go to my website, terrorjustbeshow.com and, and opt in to get the emails. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I try to write something that will be of worth to you each week. So if you want to be part of that and in orbit with me, that's the easiest way to do it. Of course, it would mean a lot if you were able to join me with the journey around the book. And for that, you can find that on my website too, or you can go to unfollowyourpassion.com. And there you'll see that if you buy the book, you get access to other bonuses too. And that's a gift for me to people who care to be in touch with me. So those are the two places, but I told you, and you know this, that I finally got on TikTok. I was already TikTok. watching it at night. <laughs> I was already scrolling through, but now I started making videos and I'm having so much fun. So if you're a TikTok person, you can easily find me there too. Um, it's just my name, Terry Gispicio, and uh, that'd be fun. But yeah, I'm really active on LinkedIn, actually. Yeah. So if people okay. are like in the career space on LinkedIn, uh, you can find me there. If you don't hear back from me, then try another platform because like <laughs> I'm around, I'm around and I'm very <laughs> open to hearing from people. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, getting on that list would be the best way to get in touch. But I really want to thank you for, for, providing this forum and for asking such thoughtful, engaged questions. And I am hoping that this relieves a lot of people today. Oh, hundred um, percent. It relieved me, at least I can say that. <laughs> right now in the zoo, and it relieved me from a lot of things that I was holding on to. Now I'm going to say this too, Amit. I've gotten a lot of emails from people in India specifically. Oh, yeah. Over the years, since that TED Talk, an overwhelming number of emails from people in India mm -hmm. who feel incredible, usually men, oh, yeah. who feel incredible pressure by their families. Uh, so this yeah. must ring a cultural bell for you. 
a lot a lot and and, and not just i think i think for me the 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 family that i grew up in it was fine like my mom and dad were like just get a job and whatever they they, <laughs> they they didn't even care about like passion and this or that when i came to us in 2016 and i went through that breakup and then i started to listen to a lot of motivational talks and this and that and that's where like i wrote a speech about it like there is no one, and, and and i wrote it just recently one year or like six months back there is no one way to live a good life there's your way and there is mine and i came to this realization after spending like 3 years or so following the scripts of other successful people other motivational gurus and this and that and i found a lot of um, um fun improvements in my life my health improved a lot of places oh, my mind yeah a lot of good things happen but i also had this realization that it is unsustainable I am following their blueprint their script of living a good life and a lot of times when like I I I wrote this mm. that at 5 a.m. I would have difficult time to get up at 5 a.m. Uh, on a winter morning to go and take a cold shower I would hear the uh, echoes of Tony Robbins in my ears and I'm uh. like <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened like I I realize this that um and I think I think that's what you said right a lot of things we we need to do we need to go there in order to realize that that's not the place that I want to go you know so you mm-hmm. you you go through those experiences and now especially when if someone would have told me that oh don't follow their scripts I would have been like what do you know but now that I I actually followed someone else's script and I understood that nah I think there's so much joy there is so much fun to take inspiration from others as you said like take a uh, take opinions take so many things from other people yes. because that is so so good but at the end of the day sit down and ask like what do what do what do i want what what serves me um that uh, new green kale juice recipe or sometimes i just want to drink that chocolate milk just drink it you know right It's, you decide you decide right so Yeah yeah so uh I I'm so glad so this this conversation definitely relieved me and uh, probably I'll go back and rewrite that speech again with some insights that I got from this conversation good <laughs> All right so guys like go ahead and if you if you love this episode um screenshot tag Terry tag me um and share what what lessons what insights that um that you get from this podcast It has been a gala journey. It has been such a fun time researching Terry, going deep into her life stories and the best part, the best part about her is I think the Gen Zs, the upcoming young adults, the millennials will vibe with her a lot because she's not as i said in the introduction she's not sitting on that high ground telling you to wake up at 5 a.m join that 5 a.m club or do this to improve your life she's like just think for yourself i'll give you some quality prompts some quality questions to go over but just think for yourself it's your life no one knows anything and that's the idea over there people are everyone is trying to guess and improvise and do this and do that but you have the ownership and you should take the ownership of your life where you are thinking for yourself becoming that independent thinker because that's that's a beautiful place to be that's where you would learn a lot about yourself and you would make a lot of sense about the world around you and a beautiful place to be at that thank you so much terry for coming on the show and saying yes it has been an honor it has been heartwarming and the less i would say no yeah. oh, thank you amit <laughs> yeah with everyone listening out there this is amit pandey you were listening to wish i knew that before see you next time yeah <laughs>